Good evening, my name's Craig Adley, and as the president and the official barman of the Urban Design Alliance, I'm really excited to welcome you all here tonight to our first Brisbane conversation. Now, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, we've had a really great response to this event um, that might have been the free beer and cheese or the free tickets, but I think it does illustrate to us the importance and the interest in the design, the development and the discussion around our cities. But before we get into all of that discussion, I just wanted to start with a quick introduction of UDAL and its relevance in the wider industry. When I joined uh, UDAL a few years ago, it was described to me as a rare gem in this industry that needed to be preserved and protected. Such was its importance to this growing city and the southeast Queensland region. I think what's special about UDAL's longevity is that it isn't driven by big budgets, by large resources or paid staff, but really by the passion and commitment of its board, its members, the speakers who come along, as well as our patrons and the love they have for this profession, as well as this city and this part of the world. Now, being an urban designer is a really privileged profession as it takes a very optimistic approach to the future of our cities. It requires a very complex and broad set of skills and it results in very significant and permanent changes to the way our cities function, how they look, but especially how we feel living within them. Being a good urban designer really requires a consideration and balance of a huge knowledge base. It requires you to understand and translate human psychology, environmental science, civil engineering, project management, you need to have an understanding of urban policy and politics, art and architecture, you need to be able to engage and speak with the community, you need to understand growth management and population pressures, you need to understand property law and commercial aspects of projects and even event planning and management of spaces. Just getting a place built is such a complex and difficult process, but getting a great place built is a really monumental achievement and every day it seems to be getting a little bit more complex and more challenging. The role and practice of urban design is also changing as well. It's still very much a creative approach of transferring ideas about a place to a simple piece of paper using your hands. Um, luckily enough, we've got Peter Richards here tonight. Um, his new book, Design Thinking Drawing, will give you a bit of an overview of the, that process, what we do day to day, and it's probably one of the best references you'll find for that process in, in this country. So if you haven't met Peter, go and um, speak to him. Peter, where are you? Oh. I'll just take cash at the end of the event for that, thank you. But we also live in a really exciting time where we've got more access than ever before to data, to information, to feedback and metrics of what we're doing. We can produce much better, more informed places and more exciting, we can visualise and design in 3D now. We can measure and test the performance of places, buildings and spaces before they're even built. We can walk around in virtual environments now. We can literally send out the concepts and plans we're doing into the palms of people's hands at any time of the day or night. So although that process of urban design's changed significantly in the last 30 years our city has, and especially in the last 10 years, it's really the decision makers, the community, who are really, and rightly so, demanding a lot more from us as urban designers. As an alliance, we really feel our role is to ensure that with all this technology, all of this change and all of this growth, that we haven't forgotten about the most important aspect of all the connection between people and place. Because there is what we've seen a lot of fear and uncertainty of our role, the process of development and assessment, and the rate of change in our cities and communities. If you take a look at any major project and even small projects at the moment, there might be a Facebook page or a community group who's actively trying to stop it or even prevent it. There's some really great work, however, being done in this space to, to educate the community, the decision makers, the developers and the designers to what good urban de design looks like, what it doesn't look like and what is lost if it's not delivered properly. Initiatives like the YIMBY movement, Plan My Brisbane have all recognised that good urban design needs to be championed and it needs to be fought for as well. It also needs to be much more clearly articulated, illustrated and communicated to the community at large. We really need the community to come on board to understand and positively contribute to the design of their suburbs with all the facts, all the information and a clear understanding of what our futures of our cities holds, essentially creating that urban design process with the designers, with the developers and with government agencies. 
As one of the older alliances, we want to again try and raise up some of these issues and have the community being advocates for much better design rather than no design at all. We want to work with others in that space as well. Now more than ever, I think I hear developers, architects, landscape architects, planners, and even engineers speak of their optimism for the future, the ability and importance of leaving a legacy in the projects they're working on, and engaging with the community to transition and support these changes as our cities grow. It is a really exciting time within this city and I think it's one that will help redefine our profession as urban designers and we'll start seeing some of the results of all of that passion and optimism and hopefully a return to more urban design education, the translation of density done well, the missing middle and more compact, better designed housing, and especially more endorsement and understanding of what great urban design can bring to the local community. Today we're delighted to share our research. Um, so just for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Property Council, we are a not-for-profit. We're an industry body representing the owners, developers and managers of property and those consultants who service them. Um, most of our members have diversified property portfolios, so we look across all of the asset classes, commercial, retail, tourism, you name it, we're focused on it. And that's part of the reason that we commissioned this research on creating great Australian cities. So our members are increasingly involved in creating precincts and whole communities. So they're looking after all facets of the community. So they're genuinely interested in what the community perception is, as well as what policymakers and our governments are actually doing to help them and to help boost communities. So I'm sure you all know the statistics that um, three quarters of the population growth in Australia over the coming 30 years will be in Australia's four biggest cities. Uh, our cities are not full, but how we accommodate that growth is really the challenge going forward. Um, so what we did, we asked Professor Greg Clark to take a look at a few different elements of cities and growth and to provide a toolkit for us. So he undertook four research papers. One of them was about benchmarking Australian cities against their global peers. So Ben will go into this further, but he took 300 different existing indexes and benchmarked Australian cities based on them. He looked at the mega trends that are going to be affecting our cities going forward. He undertook a bunch of case studies of best practice around the world, and then he developed a policy toolkit for us to use in our discussions with decision makers. So Professor Greg Clark, he may be known to some of you in the room. I know Jen Hutchin from the Cities Transformation Task Force knows him very well. Um, Professor Greg Clark is from the UK, from the business of cities. He is a globally renowned cities expert. He's worked with over 120 cities around the world to help them develop their strategies and to better understand their own cities. Here in Australia, he's worked closely with Brisbane City Council. He's done a huge body of work on New World Cities. So he actually first came across the term New World City when he was visiting Brisbane in about 2012, 2013. He was curious as to what a New World City actually is. So he went back and did a huge body of research about New World Cities, and he's now known worldwide for his work on New World Cities. Um, so he's very well known to the to the Brisbane market, including to Brisbane Marketing, and he's currently working with the state government on the SEQ City deal as well. So we chose Professor Clark for his incredible knowledge of cities around the world, but also for his local knowledge as well. In undertaking this research, Professor Clark engaged with over 100 members of the industry here in Australia. So he engaged with our members in a one-on-one -on -one format. He also ran different workshops. He met with people like Di Curry from Brisbane City Council, the committee, committee for Sydney, right? Committee for Sydney. He met with universities. He met with a whole range of people so that he could come up with a well-rounded view of the current perceptions of what it was like to live and work and to invest in Australian cities. <coughs> So from there, Ben will go through the, the findings of the research and the summary paper, but really he came up with a set of 12 recommendations and picked out five of the headline ones for Brisbane, 
which we'll talk to a bit later. But really the point of his research was to prompt discussion about more than just population growth and what the future of our cities is like, and then to come up with a toolkit to help our members and decision makers and the community so that we can move forward to have the most positive future for our big cities. Thank you, Jen, and to Craig and Katie for the opportunity, and of course, you, Dal. Um, I'm not the author of the research, of course, and I'm also not the author of the presentation, so we're all on a bit of a journey together this evening. It also means you can't shoot the messenger, but I have read through all the reports, of which there are many pages, Jen. Thank you very much. Uh, so I do feel I can share a bit of a quick snapshot or summary of the findings of the research as a town planner and as someone like, I would dare to say, all of you here tonight who have a very keen interest in contributing to the creation of great cities. So as Jen quickly outlined, there are four detailed papers which I'd encourage you to go to the website and read at your leisure, uh, particularly the, the case study and benchmarking papers I found really interesting. That outside-in perspective of Brisbane, we're such a large local government area, often we think we know best. It's quite refreshing to sit back and, and read someone else's opinion and, and see some other examples of other cities doing it much better. Now, um, Jen touched on this, but it was a global review and some of the organisations and institutions that were consulted over a hundred different groups globally, um, not to pick on you, Jen, but of interest, Committee for Brisbane's not up there. Uh, neither is Griffith University, Paul, or Udale for that matter. So we might have that discussion during question time, but I'm sure the, ne the next version of the report um, might include those groups as well. Really important slide. You've probably heard you know, this discussion before, but globally we've recently ticked over an urbanisation rate of 50%. Now more than ever before, more people live in cities than outside of them globally. And the frightening statistic is that by the end of this century, that will climb to 85% of the world's population will live in cities. People are attracted to cities, and we've heard this before also, but Australia is one of the most urbanised countries in the world. More than 90% of our population live in urban environments. So we're now in this metropolitan century, which is the term that's been uh, determined and cities matter now more than ever before and Jen quoted the statistic as well but over the next 30 years our population as a nation will grow from 25 million to some 36 million people the majority of which in our four major cities and it's a global phenomenon we're not just saying Brisbane is great so we will get big it's happening around the world so managing growth is challenging and, and with it comes great complexity but it also brings significant opportunity, and that was a big focus of a lot of this research. And it's why this study and the discussion and debate that it generates in forums such as this is so important. Megatrends, another term you've probably heard a lot of, but the fact is the world in 2050 will look very different to the world we see today. But what does it mean for cities? Well, Greg Clark talks a lot about the rise of urban services, professional services like engineering firms and, and the idea that understanding cities is now a tradable commodity. Architects can work outside of their hometown, and we're seeing a lot of that. And also, cities are now becoming the destination for tourists. People say, I'm going to Paris or New York. They don't say, I'm off to France or the United States. It's all about the city. And in terms of investment, most investors, including sovereign wealth funds, uh, are seeing higher returns in terms of innovation and investment in urban places as opposed to non-urban places. There's a real opposition to urban change, the whole YIMBY versus NIMBY debate, um, and it's a challenge we need to address together. It shouldn't be one-sided. And of course, all levels of government need to come together to get cities policy right, and we'll hear a lot of that this evening. So that was the mega trends. We now have the disruptors, the potential things that could throw a spanner in the works and transform the scenarios for cities over the next 30 to 40 years. The disruption is not unique to particular businesses or sectors. Cities are in the same boat. Things like Trump and Brexit and the effect that political instability 
perhaps including five prime ministers in five years in Australia, has on people's mood and therefore ultimately uh, investment decisions in things like cities. Environmental concerns, arguably fueling the need for increased urbanisation to achieve greater efficiency and reduce our ecological footprint. Uh, the Asian century, we've heard a lot about that. Changes in workplace, flexible working in IT, how we work today is very different from how we worked yesterday, who knows what it will be in the future. And related to that idea of the future, smart cities and how cities in our operating systems and how technology starts to begin to make its mark on our environment. I'm going to keep referencing Greg Clark and I'm really hoping he doesn't walk into the room because I hear he's in town and I'm sure it would be great fun for him to come and criticise my summary of his research, but I'll soldier on. Um, the point he makes when making this presentation is that in understanding the megatrends and having a sense of the disruptors, the dividends of, of actually resolving some of those tensions and challenges are these things on the screen here. Scale, and he's at the very strong view that cities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and will continue to do so and become more powerful. You need scale to win, but you don't necessarily need to be the biggest, but there is a critical mass threshold. Clout is the next one, and it's partially about reputation, specialisation and the idea that you need to be famous for something. Um, you need to be an influential city on the global stage. Productivity, the next one along, really about workforce and the efficiency of the city system to deliver economic outcomes. Visibility is about global visibility, online presence, popularity and so forth. Diversity is everything, housing, jobs, skills, ideas. And cohesion is about social and from a social and physical perspective. He thinks you can achieve cohesion if you have strategies that achieve all these other things. And it's fair to say, and I'm sure it's not just because he consults to them, but he's quite complimentary about Brisbane. He thinks we're doing reasonably okay and, and the size of our local government area um, is quite helpful in comparison to Sydney and Melbourne. But what he's saying is, is often growth is misdirected and I think um, that could still be said of Brisbane. Australian cities still classically push to the edges rather than consolidate, which really is planning 101. And the whole idea about good growth versus bad growth, which really is about the public dialogue and positivity around change. And the message that we know growth is coming, the choice we have to make is whether we want to do it well or not. What he's saying here is you've got the policy toolbox, which is a phrase, again, you'll hear a lot of um, on the left-hand side, and you've got sort of the intent or, or, or purpose for cities down the bottom. Um, and in the case of Australia, um, which you can see in the red, you know, we've got a minister for cities, which is a great step, but in comparison to how Singapore structures itself with its urban redevelopment authorities and the like, um, you know, we're fairly light on. Places like India have a reasonably good intent um, for cities, but they really don't have the toolbox or the governance to deliver the outcomes. The USA has always been uh, a bit of a free market, um, but across the board, most places are looking at more purposeful national policies. And his point about different levels of, of government and the private sector co-investing uh, is also a common theme or, or perhaps challenge throughout the, uh, the research. Um, agglomeration and SEQ um, is a perfect example of this idea of integrated multi-city regions and um, we're in a really strong position in SEQ but economically and socially how does the Sunshine Coast and Gold Coast and Brisbane out to Toowoomba operate as a kind of city region into the future and, and how is each of those centres different? The fourth point um, is the view that in Australia there's almost no intergovernmental collaboration and he sees that as a really, really huge barrier for us going forward. Um, again, smart cities and, and one of his favourite points about a circular economy and this idea that each stage of the economic cycle needs to feed the next. And in his view, some of the most successful places, some German and Dutch cities, are really good at that. Um, sixth point, uh, planning instruments aren't very helpful, which hurts my feelings, but I accept that to some extent. 
and the way in which government in particular funds and sets policy around change in cities uh, needs to be under the microscope. Um, the negotiated and customised solutions point uh, is a bit like market-led proposals, uh, business improvement districts or even PDAs of which we're seeing more and more of. His view is that we have a lot of purpose around this now. It gets talked about a lot, but we're not, uh, we're not very well advanced in terms of having the tools to deliver it. We're at a decision point really, which is what the red arrows mean. Um, we need to decide where we want to go. There were five different countries, but um, I've summarised it further as three clusters. The North American cities, including Canada and the US, a cluster of innovation economies and cities in Northern Europe, and then the cluster of new emerging cities of appropriate scale in the Asian context. He grabbed the five top Australian cities and compared them against these clusters across 300 different global benchmarks of economics and lifestyle and all sorts of things. And growth is one of those key themes. Um, growth is significant, but it's not unique to Australia, as you can see on these graphs. We talk a lot about how fast growing we are, but in reality, others are growing at comparable rates. But we are on the cusp of all this change. And it's interesting on the right-hand side, seeing Brisbane and Perth, the young cities of Brisbane and Perth, topping the charts, so to speak, will actually overtake most of the others, in fact, all of the others, um, in the benchmarking study in terms of growth in the coming period. So what are we doing about it is the question. We may not be able to answer tonight, but how do we actually use this growth to make a better place, which I'm sure is an issue of, of great interest to the members of UDAL. In simple terms, people think from a life, lifestyle perspective, economic, uh, even education perspective and so forth, Australia is this utopian destination. And when they get here, the reality is quite different for a lot of them. He's saying the perception component of our brand is an advantage, it's really strong, but our weakness is our, uh, our weakness on the hard measures of performance is a real risk. We might get found out. But there's a whole range of risks that come with a low density approach. We are seriously low density in comparison to other cities around the world with comparable characteristics. We have a lower density than the sprawling plains of desert Las Vegas, which is outrageous. Um, I think I need a site visit to test that, that statistic, but it's certainly one that stood out for me. Um, another is high commuting distances, and keep in mind this isn't sitting in your car on Coronation Drive, this is on, on public transport, the distance that people are travelling to get to work. Um, and Australia's performing you know, not very well um, when you consider that we're sort of second last to the United States. It's all about the pattern of our cities. Cultural facilities was a bit of a surprise for me. I'm sure Brisbane does a lot to improve the nation's rankings, but as a nation, we are underperforming in the provision of cultural facilities. And digital connectivity. Um, places like Stockholm are light years ahead of where Australian cities are, and they're actually getting the economic benefit out of it, which we're missing. This diagram is all about the innovation economy and, and there's a bit of theatre, I, I guess, in how this diagram was put together. But as you can see, San Francisco is miles ahead. No one is catching them. Um, down the, everyone else is down the bottom and the, the collection of cities in the bottom left-hand corner is blown up in the bottom diagram. So um, for those of you who can't quite make it out given the resolution, Brisbane is um, on the bottom line, with the orange dot um, sort of second to Adelaide. Oh, sorry, just in front of Adelaide. Um, so what's interesting is Brisbane is competing with all of these cities down the bottom, and whilst we're performing reasonably well with startups, they're then all leaving us. Our scale-ups aren't even registering on this benchmarking. We're actually sitting on zero or, or thereabouts, which is not great. It's a great concern, in fact, because it means that innovation and that talent is leaving our great city. And he thinks this is one of the great issues around making good on our brand promise around vital, youthful and ultimately powerful cities. Brisbane Marketing, to their credit, are doing some really great work in this space, as are the state government, but clearly we need to do more to turn that trend around. It looks like everyone's still awake, but if you're only going to pay attention to one diagram, this is the one. 
Um, this diagram effectively illustrates how Australian cities are performing in the global context. We've got high population growth, we know that. We've got high demand for higher education, which is, which is a, a great export, um, we know that. But there's huge room for improvement in our innovation ecosystem, as we've just heard, and density is outrageously low. His observation is that globally, because of the pace of government and the lack of intergovernmental cooperation, we're really slow to pivot to the knowledge economy stuff that might help grow that innovation ecosystem. And we always talk about it, but really compared to some of the Northern European countries, we are well behind. Um, and with density too comes this big challenge with change and, and, and growth, this duality around amenity. And it's something I grapple with every day as a planner dealing with government and the community. And it's this idea about this great divide between expectations on amenity. For younger generations, I'm told it's different. I don't think I qualify as a young person anymore, but I'm told they would very happily trade space for proximity. Their idea of amenity is very different. So the challenge we have is trying to make policy that reflects either one or the other. You know, we've got senior community leaders and decision makers deciding that amenity means space, and we've got the people of the future saying that you know, we don't necessarily need 800 square metres, we need a short commute because time is amenity. Time is amenity. Um, and of course we're becoming less affordable. Again, probably no surprises, but it's interesting to have that confirmed in research. Um, this next one, also interesting, um, once you realise it's not a, a catalogue for Pantone pens, um, it essentially shows the city government area versus the city metropolitan area. So the area of the city where all the decisions are made about the balance of the city. And again, no surprises there, but the much celebrated Singapore, the city is the country, it's 100%. But on the other end of the spectrum, we've got Perth sitting at 1%. The decisions are made in 1% of the Perth metropolitan area. Brisbane's faring much better, and it's great to see us beating Adelaide at something. Um, and we're miles ahead of Sydney and Melbourne um, at 50%, which puts us in a really unique position. The key observations were that high population growth cities adopt new growth management systems. We can't keep managing cities the way we've done so for the past 50 years. Cities have changed, the management systems need to adapt also. Regions, states and provinces are shifting towards strategic growth management. And one of the great examples, which I'm a strong advocate for, is this idea of a metropolitan transport authority with a single mobility strategy, instead of having five different organisations all saying, you know, my idea is better or, or, or whatnot. National initiatives are making a difference to growing metropolitan cities. So, you know, we can see real evidence that perhaps Australian cities would benefit from that approach. And private and civic leadership influences how cities, regions and individual locations are led and managed. Not really rocket science there, but again, a really important observation to draw out. So what can be learned? Well, other nations are seeing that longer term bipartisan cooperation on city development is producing pragmatic reforms and innovation. There is this high trust equilibrium, as Professor Greg Clark calls it. On the other hand, Australian cities have relatively few tools and a low level of financial and operational innovation. There is a low trust equilibrium, which in other words means there's a level of distrust between government and the private sector, and that's one of the great barriers in that although everyone talks about partnerships and so on, ultimately the private sector doesn't believe government is fast enough and effective enough in spending capital and the government doesn't believe that the private sector have the best interests of the community at heart. According to Greg Clark, the cities that are most successful tend to have this really good trust equilibrium. People are working together, and it doesn't mean they're all holding hands and agreeing on everything, but in Australia, this disconnect is quite amplified and a, re and a really big change is needed in uh, the study's findings. Which brings me to this slide. So these are effectively the conclusions of the study. We're pursuing a model that doesn't allow for urban density 
vitality and placemaking or economic development and education, all those things, all those urban services that need critical mass. In his view, again, urban services equates to high amenity. It's not just about lifestyle. Generally speaking, our cities aren't well run and are vulnerable to economic shock. We tend to have cities that are over-reliant on certain sectors and Perth is a classic example of that. Housing affordability, Sydney's now the second most expensive city in the world, yet we have this myth of the Australian dream. All of the smartest people in the world want what um, our cities don't offer, creatively, culturally and technologically. Dependency ratios are rising, it's partly about ageing population, partly about family structures changing, kids staying at home longer. The customers, people who might like to come here, tourists or people who might like to move here and contribute to the economy, um, are fairly choosy people and cities are becoming increasingly competitive. So the question we need to ask ourselves is why would someone want to come to Brisbane when they have all these other global opportunities on offer? So the distinctive Australian context, we're nearly, nearly at the end and we can discuss all of this. Um, some interesting observations here. Keep in mind, these are generalisations across Australia. These are not just about Brisbane, but some of the points I took out, you know, the strong influence on rural votes is particularly relevant to Queensland and the effect that that has on influencing government funding. You know, don't spend all the money in the city, what about the bush? Um, it also affects things like daylight savings, but that's probably another topic as well. Um, and on the right-hand side, um, over-reliance on road building, you know, time and time again. Um, and we have, this, we have a Minister for Cities and we're embarking on city deals, but we don't really have a strong view on the relative role of Australian cities as a cities ecosystem. We're still sort of competing against each other rather than working together. So what is needed for great Australian cities? The big question. In simple terms, he's saying better governance and strategic planning. Um, his view is that days of having different government departments for different things should be over. It's a real barrier holding Australia back. Um, it's causing a huge range of, of issues with these silos being created and, and a real lack of coordination. Um, the national framework piece, again, City Deals is part of that, but um, you know, we need more agreements and partnerships and models for that approach. Very importantly, proactive leadership and citizen engagement. And then the mechanisms to, to explore this. Um, the government should be spending as much as they can possibly afford on infrastructure. Where's the next cross river rail? I, I don't think anyone's really um, raising that question in the, the public forum at this point in time, but we should be. Um, public assets and the use of them. I guess that's a bit about asset sales or how do we just get more efficiency out of what we've got. Data-led decision-making around planning systems. We are a lot more smarter and sophisticated in how we can plan for our cities, so we need to make sure we're using that data. And quality of place, which is a, a really important piece, investment in how our city feels will always be important. So the recommendations, um, that's the summary. You can read many more in the reports. Um, it's about building momentum and actions like, again, a plug for integrated transport authorities and fostering new innovation and tools. Um, perhaps one of his was reforming the housing market. I'm not sure exactly what he had in mind there, but we certainly got to do something to tackle things like housing affordability in our cities. So three priorities to, to end with. Um, integrative metropolitan institutions, SEQ Council of Mayors have a lot of intent, but perhaps they need some of the power that the state government has. Longer term infrastructure investment systems with capacity for continued growth over many decades beyond political cycles, which again is holding us back. And leadership that is truly a team effort, establishing this trust equilibrium. And I'm sure there's a role for you, Dal.